I am extremely happy to welcome Joe Harrington to our economics and strategy series. He is the Patrick Harker Professor at the Wharton School at uh, Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, um, we go way back. Uh, actually, we started when, when I started at, um, as a grad student at Johns Hopkins, uh, Joe was um, a brand new assistant professor. I know he looks younger than me, but <laughs> we're, we're about the same age probably. Uh, and um, I was also one of the first um, people that he advised uh, in, uh, in, for my doctoral dissertation. So I actually take, um, take full responsibility for some of his um, first um, gray hairs that uh, he developed at that particular point in time, because I, I was not an easy advisee. Uh, anyhow, um, Joe um, is, has published do um, dozens of articles in uh, major economic journals and two textbooks. Uh, his main areas of interest are on collusion cartels and competition policy. And um, he's spoken to uh, competition policy, policy authorities all over the world and given many conferences um, in Europe and South America. And it's, uh, his work has had very significant impact in industrial organization and competition policy. So um, today he will talk to us about um, algorithmic pricing and market competition. All yours, Joe. Okay, thank you, Rafael, and particularly for that warm and entertaining introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, as the title says, I'm gonna talk about algorithmic pricing and market competition more broadly, you know, how it affects market outcomes. Okay, so what is algorithmic pricing? Well, it's just really a software program that determines a firm's prices. Now, there's a lot that comes underneath that. And I think it's useful to get a little bit of kind of organization to get, uh, get some sense about what that involves. And here are two categories where, you know, I think are kind of useful guidance. There are rule-based algorithms, which one can think of that the, the human, the company employee is specifying a lot of parameters to the pricing rule. They put it in place, they're monitoring it, they're adjusting it as they get new information. So in other words, there's a lot of human involvement, but there still is a automated portion to pricing or automated dimension to pricing. And then you have self-learning algorithms and where a lot of that monitoring and adjustment is done by the learning algorithm itself. So there's a learning algorithm which selects a pricing algorithm and that pricing algorithm is adjusted by the learning algorithm as new data and information comes in. Now here, as I described it, it's kind of two categories, but it's really a continuum which varies in terms of how much human intervention is there in the setting and the, and the um, uh, modifying of the pricing rule. Now, later on in the talk, towards the end, I'll talk a little bit more specifically about self-learning algorithms, in particular Q-learning. But let me give you two examples of rule-based algorithms, both an example where it performs as one would hope and one where it didn't perform as was desired. So it seems reasonable to, or certainly appropriate to start with airline pricing because the airline industry has been engaged in algorithmic pricing for decades under the rubric of yield management. And there's many features to it, but this gives you a flavor of it, where a pricing manager, let's say at American Airlines, chooses a number of buckets. And let's say here's for economy class. And in each bucket, we'll put a number of seats for a flight and a fare for that bucket. And so what happens when an order comes in, you know, for a fare quote? Well, typically the passenger would receive the fare associated with the lowest fare budget uh, bucket that still has a seat available. Okay, and as those lower fare buckets get exhausted in terms of their seats, then the fares go to the higher fare buckets. Now, in terms of give a flavor about what can come out of that, consider this episode where there was an Amtrak derailment. And this was in the Northeast Corridor. So for those people who are planning to take the train from New York to DC, let's say, well, all of a sudden now they're gonna to have to fly from LaGuardia to Reagan National. So all of a sudden this is sudden and unanticipated spike in demand. So what happened to fares? Well, fares increased a lot. On average, probably about fivefold, as, as high as tenfold. Now in response to that, there was this claim that the airlines like American, US Airways were engaging in price gouging. That some price manager 
had seen the derailment, recognized that demand was going to spike, and so they went into the system and raised the prices. But that's not what happened. This was all automated because what happened with, these, with the increase in demand, the lower fare bu uh, buckets exhausted all their seats. And so what was left was only the, you know, the buckets with $1,000 for, for a plane flight or $2,000. So this is all programmed in. This is a rule-based algorithm in action. And in fact, it did exactly what it was designed to do, which is if there is some, some demand spike, that the, the prices will be raised, okay? Okay, so that's a kind of a traditional one. And now here's this other one, which probably some of you have seen because it's come, become rather famous. Uh, this is a case of two booksellers uh, selling a book called The Making of the Fly. And what, he, what each of these two booksellers had was a very simple rule-based algorithm. So if we look here, Profnath, had this rule which says the, the program would look at the price for this book set by a competitor, Bordy Books, and just set a price a little bit below it. So they charge a price equal to 0.9983 times the price that Bordy Books had set. Bordy Books had a similarly simple pricing algorithm. And what it did was said, well, I'm going to look at the price of Prothnath and set a price a little bit above 27% higher than what Prothnath set. Well, these prices were updated daily. And you can imagine what happens here. The fact is prices were going up almost 27% every day because Bordy Books would look at Prothnath's price and then raise it by 27%. Prothnath would just undercut that. Next day, Bordy Books would be 27% above that and so forth. And so if these price, the books prices started at $35, it would take less than two months to get the prices up to almost $24 million, which is where they peaked. And here's a screenshot of part of that process. Okay, so this is another simple rule-based algorithm, uh, but one that obviously, you know, really didn't, uh, wasn't particularly effective and uh, was in some ways kind of really sim too simple and too stupid. Okay, now, so those are some examples. I can think start thinking about well, why is it that, you know, firms would go to algorithmic pricing? What are they, some of the big advantages? And there are many on both the revenue and cost side. On the revenue side, what it, what it can allow them to do is to tailor prices both across time and across buyers. By setting up an automated system, then the price can respond very quickly to high frequency information, such as competitors' prices, which is what we just saw with the online booksellers. Or it could respond to demand shocks, as we saw with the airline pricing, or to inventories, or anything else for which the firm would have data on. So the industry likes to call this dynamic pricing, but the point is that you have a pricing algorithm, it can respond quickly to this information, to the change in the environment, that would suggest that you ought to, ought to change your price. Now, the other dimension, often referred to as personalized pricing, is where you're pricing in order to, uh, or you're going to tailor the prices to certain mar market segments. And this is coming from the additional information you have about different consumers. It could be about their past purchases, clickstream activity, their zip code. But with all that very fine-grained information, a uh, algorithmic pricing can adjust the price depending upon the market segment. So there's certainly a lot of potential to have very sophisticated pricing through algor algorithmic pricing that will enhance revenue. Uh, Giving an example of, of what the third party vendors of these pricing algorithms are kind of selling themselves as, and that just kind of illustrates what I was saying on the previous slide. Uh, take A2I Pricecast, which says its technology utilizes learning algorithms to construct dynamic profiles of customers and their usage patterns, as well as competitors. These systems rapidly and intelligently react to changing customer behavior, changing markets, and unexpected events. Okay, so it encompasses all what I just was, was referring to. Now, A2I will come back to later in the talk 
when we look at the use of algorithmic pricing in the German retail gasoline market. Okay. Now, another question one can ask is, well, why has algorithmic pricing become you know, so much more of a big deal? As I mentioned, the airlines have been doing this for decades. Now, certainly part of the answer here is innovations in AI, uh, but really the, the, the dominant factor is simply data. Uh, and, you, and here's kind of three ways in which the, the increase in data you know, that we're living in the, the time of big data really makes algorithmic pricing quite compelling. You know, you think about pricing as it used to be, you'd have a pricing manager, they'd have some hard information in the form of data, but there's lots of things that weren't quantified and they would have their experience, their wisdom, their gut about how to price. What's happened over time is with the increase in hard information, there's less of a need to rely on the subjective soft information. And so, uh, so what the implication is that algorithmic pricing has, in terms of relative performance, increased relative to the old model, which was this combination of data and kind of price manager's intuition. Okay, so the increase in data has just enhanced the relative performance of an algorithm pricing versus just a manager pricing. Going to the second factor here, you know, how often you wanna change price depends upon how often your environment you know, is modified. If you're receiving demand information once a week, then there's probably not much of a good reason to change your price more than once a week. However, if you're receiving demand information once an hour, well, now it's, it's more valuable to be changing your price at a high frequency in line with the change of your environment and the information you receive about it. So the increase in the frequency of data has made it more worthwhile to change prices at high frequency. And that's just, isn't really plausible to do if you're having humans change prices. So you want to have an automated response to the change in the environment. And with big data, they often talk about volume, variety, and velocity. Well, volume and variety is really in this first bullet point and, and velocity. The speed of new information is in the second bullet point. And the third reason why you know, you know, more data is really important for the increased use of algorithmic pricing is uh, concerning the self-learning algorithms. Because these self-learning algorithms, as I said, we'll talk more about at the end, uh, they start out with really an arbitrary pricing rule. And the idea there is they use the pricing rule, they get feedback on it in terms of its performance, and then the self-learning the learning algorithm adjusts the pricing algorithm based on that information. So how good they can make that pricing rule, which starts from kind of an arbitrary pricing rule to potentially something that's very profitable, depends upon how much data and feedback they get. So once again, with the increase in the amount of data, the frequency of it, these self-learning algorithms now can do, can perform much better. So basically, it's more data that's driving the algorithmic pricing. Now, we think about where it's occurring, in some sense it's occurring everywhere, but there are certain markets where it's particularly prevalent. Okay. Uh, one area is where demand tends to fluctuate much more than supply. And think about kind of airlines, hotels, ride hailing. And so these are cases where if you don't adjust price quickly in response to this information, you're foregoing profits because supply is out of line with demand. Okay. A second area is where demand is very sensitive to price, such as where competitors have very similar products, such as in the retail gasoline market, or think about where uh, your demand is dependent upon where you are on that search engine or whether you're in the buy box, and that's very sensitive to where your price is relative to competitors. In those instances, it's, it's really valuable to get, a, get really good information on competitors' prices and to respond quickly to that. And certainly we've seen algorithmic pricing used very frequently there. A third area is where the cost varies across consumers. So think about credit and insurance. You know, what is the cost of providing a loan? Well, that's tied to the default risk of that individual. What's the cost of insurance? Well, it depends upon the likelihood that individual will, will, will make a claim. So machine learning is really valuable here for taking data on individuals, making person-specific predictions on probabilities, 
which is then fed into determining what the optimal price is. And the last one is areas where there's just a lot of products to be priced. You have hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of goods. Changing price is a laborious process, and obviously it's valuable to automate that. Now we can see a lot of benefits to firms from instituting algorithmic pricing. Let's think about this more broadly from kind of from a welfare perspective. Uh, there's lots of possible efficiencies from algorithmic pricing. I mean, markets will clear more efficiently, faster, because of the fact your firms are responding quicker to supply and demand information. Uh, there's simply, as we've already mentioned, they reduce costs from adjusting prices and monitoring the environment in terms of having the information that you need to uh, change your prices. Uh, you think about a new entrant into a market where you can't rely upon algorithmic pricing. You need to learn and kind of have develop your own experience about what's the right way to price. But now, if you come into a market, you can potentially get a pricing algorithm from a third party vendor, which will get you down that learning curve very quickly. So that reduces barriers to entry. And there's certainly other efficiency advantages. Uh, at the same time, there's possible consumer harm from algorithmic pricing. And a number of competition authorities have expressed concerns in this regard. You know, if you look at personalized pricing, I mean, what that's partly that's going to entail is identifying high value consumers and charging them a high price. So we're getting surplus that's moving from those consumers to the firm. On the other hand, it also means identifying low value consumers who might previously had not bought because the prices were too high. But now once you've identified them, you can set a lower price for them, make money on them, and they're better off as well. So that's kind of a kind of a mixed welfare bag. Uh, but then there's really more the concern about reduced price competition. You might, might first think that, well, with this quicker price adjustment, this could lead to you know, rapid undercutting of prices and thus end, you end up with very low prices. But that's exactly what firms want to avoid. And in fact, concern about that will in, indeed kind of deter undercutting rivals because of the fact that you're kind of concerned that the rival will be able to immediately retaliate. And in fact, third party vendors kind of emphasize that their pricing algorithms, algorithms will avoid price wars, such as Feedvisor saying their algorithm will help you avoid price wars. Repricer Express, there are features to help sellers detect and avoid a price war. So this rapid price adjustments could result in fewer price wars as obviously harmful to consumers. It could also lead to coordinated price increases. And we'll come back to that later when we talk about collusion. And then there's a third source of potential harm, which is coming from the fact that third parties are playing a bigger role in pricing now that we have algorithmic pricing. And we'll kind of spend a fair amount of time on that, so I won't elaborate, won't elaborate on it right now. So here's kind of a, an overview of the, of the, the talk. All those are by way of kind of introductory remarks. So I want to go over two examples to begin with, one showing the benefits of algorithmic pricing, and that's search pricing with Uber. And if you ever had to pay search pricing, you may not think it's all that great, but the fact is consumers benefit from search pricing. As we'll see, drivers are actually harmed by it. And then we'll look at an example where algorithmic pricing is harming consumers. It's resulting in higher prices. And that's in the case of uh, pricing of allergy medicines. And then we'll look at third party pricing. That is where the price is not being set by the firm that's selling the good, but by some third party. It could be a platform. It could be that a firm delegates its pricing decision to some intermediary. Or it could be that the firm technically still says, sets price but it's using a pricing algorithm that's been developed by a third party vendor. And then I wanna to turn to collusion and talk about to what extent pricing algorithms make collusion easier. And also the question, well, can self-learning algorithms actually learn to collude? And is that something we should be concerned with? Okay. So uh, at this point, before we move on, this would be a natural place if there are any Kind of initial questions. Doesn't look like anything popping up. Does anyone want to 
hit that raise hand function or chat the question. Okay. Okay, we'll move on. Okay, so let's start with this study. This is by uh, Juan Camilo Castillo, who just happens to be a colleague of mine at the University of Pennsylvania. But the fact is I'm presented here because it's, it deals with a really interesting question, which is what are the welfare effects of surge pricing? Okay, is that something that benef benefits society? And if it does, who does it benefit and does, does anyone harm? So what he has, he has data from Uber, happens to be from Houston over a several, uh, several month period. And I should note here, this was a time period where Lyft was not in the market. So it was just a single ride hailing service. And in terms of appreciating uh, the kind of the results, let's so just kind of go through how fares are determined. The total fare you get is determined by a base fare and a surge multiplier. So the base fare is just this function of, of trip distance and duration. That's something that's periodically adjusted, but not in anywhere near real time. And, but the fare you pay is the base fare times the surge multiplier. And that surge multiplier depends upon basically how much demand to what extent it exceeds supply. So it's based on passenger requests and the available drivers in a particular area. And that's updated every two minutes. Most of the time, the surge multiplier is one, but every now and then it's much higher because of the fact that demand far exceeds supply. So this is what a screen looks like for a driver. So let's say a driver sees this uh, kind of screen right here where the redder is the area, the higher is the surge multiplier. So around here, there's no, the surge multiplier is just one, but the driver can see that, well, there's some high surge multipliers around here and even higher over here. And so if they zoom in, they see something like this, <clears throat> where they see the exact surge multipliers. So they could see if they're right now here, they get 2.2 times the base fare if they picked up a passenger. Over here, they get three times. Okay? And so this is what they see and what you, you hope with surge pricing is that the availability of these higher fares is gonna bring drivers that are out here, which might be an ample supply into here where they're in short supply. <clears throat> so, so what they have is the, he has um, outcomes from Uber, which is obviously where surge pricing was in place. And then he's able to estimate a model to simulate, well, what would things look like if there was no surge pricing? And his interest is in seeing what happens to rider surplus and driver's profits, and also Uber's profits, but we're just gonna look at riders and drivers. And just to get to his punchline, and then we'll kind of explain what's going on behind it, he finds that riders are better off with surge pricing. If we compare a world with surge pricing and without it, riders are better off with surge pricing, but drivers are worse off. Okay? And on net, you know, total welfare is higher. So let's see why uh, riders are better off, but drivers are worse off. So there's three effects that are going on here. First of all, there's going to be a reduction in wait time because of surge pricing. Okay, just simply because you have, uh, that's gonna induce uh, drivers to go from places where there's not enough drivers to where you need drivers. And this left figure shows us a time saved. And in fact, drivers save a lot more time than riders, but both save time due to surge pricing. However, the surplus in terms of the additional surplus from that reduction in waiting time is actually higher for riders than it is for drivers. And that's because riders are found to just value their time much more than drivers. So the reduced in wait time benefits both uh, passengers and drivers, but passengers are benefited much more. The second point is you're gonna get more efficient matching, but that really is gonna benefit riders. So imagine here you have, you have a car, a, a driver, and you have two potential passengers, which are you know, the same distance away. Uh, and one values getting the ride much more than the other one. If there's no surge pricing, they may both be willing to pay the going fare and then it's just a 50-50 chance as to which one the driver gets. And there's an inefficiency there because the one that values it more is only picked up 50% of the time. But if you have surge pricing, 
it's more likely that the one who values it more is only be, is, is the one that's willing to pay that price, not the one who values it less. And so it's more likely that the, that the uh, passenger with a higher willingness to pay is going to be matched with the driver. Okay, and that really benefits riders. So that's another source of benefit to riders. And then the third point, which I'm not gonna kind of get into all what's behind it, but what he finds is that the average fare would be, it would be actually higher if there was not surge pricing. And this has to do with how, what Uber's trying to maximize. And so what that means is that passengers are gonna be better off from the lower average fare of surge pricing and drivers are gonna be worse off. And that's where drivers are worse off. Okay, so here's a case where, you know, surge pricing, which is made a very uh, kind, of a, kind of a canonical case of algorithmic pricing is enhancing welfare and leading just to, to a more efficient market. Now let's go to this example where things aren't so good for consumers. So this is a study by Brown and McKay. And so what they have is hourly prices from over-the-counter allergy drugs from the five largest online retailers. And I'm gonna point out a couple properties of their data. And then we wanna kind of explain kind of a, a, what are their findings and see what's behind that. So the first kind of property, which is really quite interesting, is that there's a lot of variation among the online retailers as to how often they change their prices. So retailer A changes uh, 30, prices of 37% of its products every day. Retailer B, about 9%. Retailers D and E between two and two and a half percent. Retailers C less than one percent. So a wide variation in how frequently they're changing their prices. And as we'll see, this is not really due to different technologies. This is actually really a choice among the different retailers. Okay, so that's the first observation. Um, and here, let me just kind of show you some figures so you get a better sense about how prices are being changed. So this is over the course of the week. And this is the vertical axis is the percentage of products whose prices are being changed. And we can see that for both retailer A and retailer B, they're changing prices all over the, you know, all through the week. For retailer C, they're also changing the prices every day, but it's always in a window, kind of in the like 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Okay, they're changing prices. And not many prices, that's about, you know, you know, about about 4%. Okay, well, let's see, I guess. I think that's right, yes. Um, so retailer C is changing prices daily within a window. Retailer D and E is the same. It's just changing prices once a week. So we see this big variation. A and B are changing their prices on a very high frequency basis, you know, many times within a day, potentially. C once a day, uh, once a day and D once a week. The second property is that there's a relationship between the price levels and how frequently a retailer is changing prices. So what we have here on the horizontal axis is the pricing frequency in terms of the meeting hours between changing prices. And it's in, you know, it's, it's uh, inverse in terms of uh, starting with very high number down to a low number. So we can see here retailer A is changing the median time between price changes is one hour, retailer B two hours, retailer C one day, Retailers D and E, what a week. Okay. The vertical axis is a price index. So we can see that retailer A, who's changing the prices most frequently, has the lowest prices. Retailer B, well, their price is about six to 7% higher. Retailer C, about almost 10% higher. D and E, 28 to 33% higher. Okay. So firms, who are more rapidly changing their prices are setting lower prices. Okay, so, so what's going on here? Um, think about it from the perspective of, let's say, retailer E. Retailer E, go back here, or retailer D, well, they're gonna change their price on Sunday. And they know from experience that retailers A and B, and to some extent C, is going to respond to that price because retailers A and B they're changing prices all the time. 
and they're going to see retailer D's new price, and they're going to respond to that. And in particular, how they're going to respond is the following, which is retailer D sets a higher price, A and B are going to set a higher price. If retailer D sets a lower price, that's going to cause A and B to set a lower price. So what that means here is that the retailers who change prices infrequently are acting like price leaders vis-a-vis -vis the retailers who are changing prices rapidly who are acting like price followers. And if you're a price follower, you tend to price below the price leader. And so that's why we're getting the firms who price change their prices more frequently are charging lower prices. But here's the key, but here's really more of the takeaway. The takeaway is this arrangement of having differential pricing frequencies is leading to higher average prices. Because if all the firms chose basically the same pricing frequency, there'd be no price leader or price follower. It'd be kind of almost like choosing prices simultaneously. But with the differential price frequencies, the ones who price, you know, change their prices infrequently will act like price leaders and they will tend to raise their price in order to drag up the prices of the, of the firms that change, change their prices frequently who are acting like price followers. So what they've done is they've settled on these different price frequencies, changing different rates of which they're changing prices, creating this artificial leader follower arrangement, which has led to higher average prices. Okay. So this is a case where algorithmic pricing, I would say, has not benefited and actually harmed consumers. Okay, um, and I think uh, pretty much covered that. So, so thus far, what are we seeing? Algorithmic pricing matters. We can see in these two examples, it can benefit or harm consumers. And now we wanna to turn to looking at, you know, what are the implications of a third party setting prices, which I think is a very important characteristic of algorithmic pricing. And then we'll turn to looking at the role of algorithmic pricing and collusion. So again, this is this would be a, a good time for any questions. Uh, Raphael. Uh, yes, I have, I have a quick question. Um, so in this uh, leader follower arrangement that you're seeing, um, do the leaders and the followers tend to stay the same or is there some, some kind of alternation in the role? Uh, good question. Um, so let's see here. They just have data over this period of April to October, and it was stable during that time period. Uh, so it's hard to say whether, um, you know, that would persist because there's certainly, it's generally the case that price followers make higher profits than price leaders. So it certainly would be desirable for the price followers and price leaders to kind of alternate if they're to achieve some sort of a kind of a mutually beneficial situation, though everyone benefits from, from this. Um, my guess is it probably does persist beyond this window just because there's kind of a learning process for them to get to this point. So if all of a sudden retailer D started changing its prices at a much higher frequency, you know, it takes some time for the other retailers to adjust and um, and it's not clear that profits would, you know, the profits could suffer in the meantime. But it, but it certainly is an interesting question in terms of, you can see how this could be stable. The question is, well, how do you get to that? And then is there any way for them to kind of rotate their positions, you know, within this? Rich, you're up next. Um, I enjoyed the talk. So here's my question. With any of this in a learning algorithm, the, um, the, the, you know, you can use APIs to get or scraping to get pricing and all the rest of that. The, the best models generally, you want a single sandbox where you can get clickstream data and all the other data that's necessary to evaluate the customer you have your competitors pricings. You know, is this, my question is, is that this works bad, does this work best when everybody's shopping for everything on Amazon, or for that matter, social selling now with Facebook, there's, this doesn't go unnoticed by me that their push into this has something to do with being in the middle of between, you know, sellers and buyers, and all the rest of that, and what you can do with that strategy position, you know, algorithmic pricing will work best there. If Google was in, 
they would have a wonderful time because they have Chrome and all your search history and really can ferret out where it is you're going, what you're doing. Am I, is this kind of where we're going? Is this the center of the target here for perfect price discrimination and kind of getting in that way? Uh, I mean, really good question. And I don't have an answer to it. Um, certainly, um, this has been a concern I know of uh, competition authorities about you know, data as an asset and how, and this has come up in merger evaluations, you know, what happens when you're combining data from these different sources and how that, how that affects consumers. You know, so uh, I haven't seen any particularly good case on that, but it clearly is on you know, their radar screen in terms of in a consideration uh, in any sort of merger evaluation that, you know, as I said, it comes back to the fact that data is an asset and this point of data, you can, once again, you can tell stories both ways, particularly with price discrimination. We know the welfare effects can be rather mixed. Uh, so all I can say is that, yeah, I don't have, a, have an answer to provide on that, but that's clearly an important question that, you know, the authorities are trying to wrestle with. Mohammed, you're up next. Uh, hi. Uh, my question is about this, uh, the, this last uh, ex, uh, paper. Uh, just judging about, uh, like, having higher average prices hurt the consumers it seems not sufficient to me because if consumers can react and then like the, depends on the volume of sales, if the consumers can react and fewer buy at the higher price and more take advantage of the lower prices, then consumers could potentially benefit or I'm missing something here. No, I mean, you know, no, you're right. Uh, that is uh, intertemporal substitution could allow them to undo some of this. Um, and, uh, and I, yeah, and I don't know how much of that is done. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, basically, you know, consumers would need to have some knowledge of these kind of regularities and prices. You could imagine it in a product like this, which is a repeat purchase good. Um, so all I'll just say is I think that is, that is a you know, very relevant caveat to making the welfare assessment. And so it comes down to you know basically how much do consumers know and how much can they engage in the intertemporal substitution, okay? Because it's not so much and it's not so much sales, but rather that you know if if for example you know that you know the retailer D raises its price on the Sunday, okay? If you're really smart, then you should know that well retailers A and B will respond to that. Now of course they're going to respond to that by raising prices them as well, but they're going to tend to be below it, you know so. It, yeah, it's not clear how it all nets out, but certainly if we hold that fixed, you know, then moving to price leader, price follower arrangements is going to tend to result uh, in, in average prices. And of course, you get back to the point here that if, if the firms have kind of consciously tried to create this arrangement, well, they're doing so because it delivers higher profits to them. That's generally gonna mean lower uh, value to consumers unless there's some sort of efficiency that comes from them doing this. Yeah. Diliana. Hi, um, my name is Diliana. And my question to you, Joseph, is if all the companies in an industry have a fast but identical pricing frequency, will the overall pricing for consumers be lower or higher because there will be no pricing leader? Uh, I would say, you know, everything else is the same. The prices, prices will be lower. OK, thank you. Yeah. Everything else is the same. same. Looks like we have a question from Adam. Okay. Oh, Adam, I think Adam took his hand down. So I think actually we're good to go. Okay. Sorry, Adam, do you have a question? Feel free to unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, there was a point made earlier about uh, about you know, clickstream services enabling a more perfect price discrimination. Uh, the flip side of that is that if consumers realize that they are consistently uh, paying more for the same products and and they and they have a motive they then have a motivation to begin blocking these clickstream services and you know there are tools out there that enable just that and you know, they're starting to uh, gain more and more traction in, in the marketplace so I mean it, it, as much as uh, as 
you know, companies would you know, have a motivation to uh, build out services that enable more perfect price discrimination. There, there's also uh, there's also consumers have a motivation to do the exact opposite. No, absolutely. And you know, my best reading of the the evidence is that firms really haven't. You know, you think about these two dimensions: dynamic pricing that's responding to at high you know high frequency uh, information. And then you have the personalized pricing, more price discrimination across consumers. You don't really see, you see a lot more of dynamic pricing than of the personalized pricing. You know, there are these isolated episodes where, you know, they condition prices on zip code and on, you know, whether you're operating, you know, whether you're using an iPhone uh, or, you know, or, uh, or the, you know, the alternative um, um, and, 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 whether you have a Mac or not, there's actually evidence showing that there's sometimes prices different whether using a Mac or a PC, but they seem more anecdotal. So I think it's right. I think firms have been a little bit hesitant to you know go down that path because when they've experimented with it, there's been a lot of pushback. And as well as you as you just pointed out, if they say the heck with the pushback, we're going to pursue this, there are responses that consumers can do. And, and apps will arrive and uh, arise to, uh, to kind of deal with that. And in fact, there's a very nice paper by Michel Gall called Algorithmic Consumers, which really explores that, you know, in terms of thinking about this as, you know, there's another side to this. There's is a game between the firms. If they're gonna engage in these types of exercises to kind of extract more surplus from consumers, there's things that the consumers can do just as you described, okay. And, but there really doesn't seem thus far there's been much activity on, on really either side. Okay, why don't we um, move on? So let's look at uh, third party pricing. <clears throat> um, and so one place this happens is indeed one example we've already looked at, which is ride hailing services. You know, so we're looking at a platform here, it's matching you know, uh, two sides of the market, drivers and passengers as with Uber property owners and renters, as with Airbnb and the like. Uh, now, what's interesting is you see wide variation in the role of the platform in the pricing between the two sides of the market. I mean, as we know with Uber, they control the prices. Okay, so they set the prices that drivers are going to charge. The Amazon Marketplace, uh, Amazon Marketplace offers a pricing algorithm, which many uh, third party, you know, many vendors use. Uh, but they're not required to do so. Airbnb, once again, gives pricing authority to the property owner, but they provide a recommended price under the title of smart pricing. And TaskRabbit, which is matching people who need some service performed and someone who's willing to perform it, they don't get involved at all in the pricing process. So there's, real, there's variation there. <clears throat> now, we could spend an entire uh, kind of day talking about platforms and the role of pricing. So let me just bring up one very idiosyncratic issue, but I find to be an, an interesting one, which is associated with the legal case brought against Uber. So this is Spencer Meyer versus Travis Kalitnik, the founder of Uber. And in the complaint, the plaintiff stated, Mr. Kalitnik had conspired with Uber drivers to use Uber's pricing algorithm to set the prices charged to Uber riders, thereby restricting price competition among drivers. So here the view was that the drivers are competitors and that in principle is true. And they were not setting prices. Uber was mandating price that they set basically the same price. Uber responded saying in the contract, a driver shall always have the right to charge a fare that is less than the prearranged fare. And that's actually true. I didn't realize that till I, till I read the brief. Um, but the problem here is that there's no reason for a driver to provide a lower fare because once the passenger has accepted that fare and the driver shows up, the driver knows they're willing to pay it, so why offer a lower fare? And then the plaintiffs responded also that said that though Uber claims to allow drivers to depart downward from the fare set by the algorithm, there is no practical mechanism by which drivers can do so. And that is true. Now, um, there's a a lot of questions one could ask associated with this. You could ask, is it illegal or should it be illegal for a platform to control the prices at which the two sides of the platform transact? Um, is it illegal or should it be illegal for competing firms, in this case drivers, to allocate their pricing authority to the platform? How is welfare affected by the platform controlling the price? And two of the 
factors that would enter into trying to address those questions are first, the market power of the platform. Is there another competing platform as there is in ride hailing with Lyft? And that makes a difference because Uber can, you know, that constrains their, their market power, their ability to result in higher prices. But there's also the technological feasibility of decentralizing pricing authority that has to be thought about. And so the only point I wanna make here is that the way Uber does it, is it doesn't have to be the way that the platform determines prices. And, and, and the example here is from a ride hailing service in the Czech Republic called lyft go So lyft go actually gives pricing authority to the, to the drivers. So what a driver will do at the beginning of typically of their shift, they'll program in several tariffs. Each tariff has a per kilometer fare, a flagging fee and a per minute waiting fee. And they can put in as many as they like, but typically it's about five. Now, when a passenger puts in a request and a driver is pinged, what's gonna come up on, their, on the driver's phone is going to be the fares associated with that passenger and the tariff formulas that the, the driver put in at the beginning of the day. And so they might come up and so maybe there's a high tariff fare they put in. And so they could decide, well, do I propose to that passenger the high one or let's say the low one? And so maybe I'm a driver towards the end of my shift and I'm kind of tired. I'm not only gonna take the fare if I get the high fare, so I press the high fare. Or maybe I know that there's lots of cars around right now, lots of drivers, so it's gonna be very competitive. So I choose the low fare. What the customer observes is what we see over here. What's gonna come onto their screen is for each driver, the waiting time for that driver, uh, their star rating and, and the, uh, the price that that uh, driver's offering. So if I'm here in, uh, in Prague, I could say I could go with Milos, I'll wait 13 minutes, it'll cost me 369 Karuna. Or I could say, well, I only wanna wait 10 minutes with Joseph, but I'm gonna pay a higher price for 76. Okay. So the fact is we can decentralize pricing authority and the question is, well, is this something that should be mandated or something that's kind of left for the platform to decide? So here I just kind of put this out. It's kind of an interesting you know, case, uh, but there's lots of fascinating questions associated with it. So now let's go to another type of third party pricing. And this is where a firm decides, well, listen, pricing is, it's gonna to take too much of my time. There is this uh, third party service where I can give them pricing authority and they'll decide the price for me. Uh, and, and the case that being examined here is with sponsored search auctions, which we're all familiar with. So think about here, I'm an advertiser. Let's say I provide tattoo removal and I want to appear on Google's search engine as an ad when someone puts in tattoo removal in, in, the, in the search box. So what I will submit to Google is a bid amount and a budget, <clears throat> excuse me. When someone puts in tattoo removal in the search box, Google conducts this auction among all those advertisers submitted bids for that keyword, and then we'll allocate slots based upon the bid and some, some measure of ad quality. And of course, we know that uh, if, if, I, if I, as an individual, click on this ad, well, then that's when the advertiser is gonna to have to make a payment to Google. And for the data that uh, they're using in this study, the median click of price per click was 90 cents and the average was actually $2.34, so fairly high. Okay, so think about now I'm an advertiser and I have to decide how much to bid. You know, I may be some small shop and I don't know how to bid at auctions. So what a lot of advertisers do is they delegate this authority to another company. And more generally what happens is advertisers are gonna run marketing campaigns through what's called the digital marketing agency. And the digital marketing agency actually is going to actually delegate bidding on these sponsored search auctions for their clients to what's called the network. And there are basically seven networks out there. Now, so what that means then is this bidding, you might have many advertisers but there's actually just seven entities that are submitting bids. So maybe you got a thousand shops with tattoo removal, but there's actually seven separate organizations that are setting bids 
for those thousand if they're all trying to advertise. Now there can be efficiency rationales for that. You know, I already kind of argue that, you know, that a small shop doesn't have the expertise. You know, this network has much better data, they have the incentives to invest in better algorithms and so forth. But there's obviously also a competitive concern. And here we just go by way of example, think about you put in tablet into the, into the search box. And who are the advertisers, potential advertisers who would have bid on appearing as an ad in response to the keyword tablet? Well, be like Dell, Samsung, Apple, a number of other ones. Well, it turns out that all these companies are having their bids set by the same single entity. All of them are clients to the same company. And so obviously there's a concern there that this third party who's sending these bids for their clients and their clients are competitors in this market may not be too aggressive with their bidding. And so there's obviously this competitive concern. And so what this paper does is try to get at, well, is this actually present and how big is it? And let me just kind of get to the punchline, which is this last bullet point, which is, I mean, they have many results in the paper, but this kind of gives the flavor of it. Suppose you were to take these seven networks and consolidate them into six. Just think about one of them being acquired. So there's only six networks. That's gonna naturally concentrate things in that now you have more competitors or bids are gonna be controlled by the same network. What they find is that that would reduce Google's revenues by about 10%. Now, maybe you think that, well, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, Google's being pursued in an antitrust case. They've misbehaved. Oh, that's fine. But more of the general point here is that there's a general trend towards delegating pricing authority to a third party. And there's efficiency rationales for that. But, you know, if there's going to be a natural concentration of competitors at these third parties. And so you're going to have an agent who's setting prices for competitors. And there's obviously a potential harm from that. The last source of third party pricing I'm going to talk about, and then I'll break once again for questions, uh, is where it's provided by, pricing algorithm is provided by a software developer. So once again, think about here, I'm going to set price. I could try to develop my own pricing algorithm, but rather I'm going to go to a third party vendor who's going to sell me their pricing algorithm. And so a question we want to ask here is the following. I mean, we've already talked about the fact that that third party might have more resources, more data, more expertise, and thus be able to develop a better algorithm. But let's just focus on the design decision. And in particular, you know, how do the design incentives of a firm, which is to use the algorithm, differ from the design incentives of a firm, which is to sell the algorithm? Um, and, and there's a very fundamental difference between those two companies. If I'm a third party, a vendor developing a pricing algorithm, I want to sell to as many companies as possible. And in particular, it might mean many companies within the same market. So it may mean competitors. So I have to be concerned with the fact that when I develop this pricing algorithm, it might end up competing against itself in the market because two firms who compete both bought my pricing algorithm. Now I want my pricing algorithm to perform well in terms of higher profits, but if I design it to be really aggressive and two of my kind of uh, two competitors in a market adopt my pricing algorithm, they're going to realize fairly low profits and they're going to, you know, they're not going to want to continue paying me for my pricing algorithm. So this possibility creates the fact that maybe the third party is going to design its pricing algorithm to be kind of less aggressive, less competitive because of the fact that it would like competitors in a market to adopt their pricing algorithm. This is clearly a concern to uh, authorities. Uh, the OECD has said that concerns of coordination would arise if firms outsource the creation of algorithms to the same IT companies and programmers. This might create a scenario where coordination is caused by competitors relying on the same algorithms. The German Monopolies Commission said that a third party may sell an algorithm that it knows could contribute to a collusive market outcome and it is even conceivable that they see such a contribution as an advantage as it makes the algorithm more attractive for users interested in profit maximization. So the third party 
has a different incentive in terms of designing the algorithm rather than the algorithm is designed by the firm itself that sells the good. Okay. So let's look at this case here where we do have competitors adopting a pricing algorithm from the same, same, same third party vendor. So this is from the uh, German retail gasoline market where they have this wonderful data from the, uh, from the German government. So they have gasoline and diesel prices for every five minutes for every gas station over this six year period. Uh, for the later results, you might keep in mind here, the average margin is 13 cents. And now we come back to A2I, which we mentioned at the very beginning of the talk. And they started offering their pricing algorithm, algorithm to retail gasoline companies. And, and to see in terms of how that kind of works, well, what they do is got this six step process associated with the algorithm. They build a database based on transactions and, and then they take current data on weather and traffic and the like. They use that to predict demand. The owner, well, that is the firm, is going to set parameters in the pricing algorithm in terms of how much do they value volume, how much do they value margins, and all that information will go into the algorithm now producing a price, and that will generate some transactions, new data, and you go back to step one. Now you have an expanded kind of database. So the real question here is, you know, what happens to margins after these algorithms are adopted? So here's the pattern of adoptions. Here's the five main, uh, well, excuse me, the four main uh, gasoline chains in Germany. And what we, and on the vertical axis is the share of their stations uh, that adopted the pricing algorithm, which without going into details had to be indirectly inferred by the scholars in the, in the study. But what we can see here is that around mid 2017, there was a, a large adoption of the pricing algorithm. What was observed is the number of daily price changes went from six to 10. And it was also observed that, that uh, firms were responding more quickly, about 20% more rapidly to competitors' prices. So what we wanna look at is, is how do margins after the adoption of this pricing algorithm by competitors compared to margins beforehand? Well, they find that average price cost margins go up by 12%. Okay, now that could mean it's less competitive. It could mean there's some sort of efficiency advantages from it. But I think what's more telling is that if you zero down to duopoly markets, which are not kind of nice clean subsample. And so these are markets where there's only two stations in close proximity. What they find is that if one of the two stations adopts the pricing algorithm, there's no effect on margins. But if both stations adopt, there's a significant increase in margins by 29%. Minimum prices go up by eight cents, which is quite large given that the marge, average margin beforehand was 13 cents. Uh, these effects, however, did not, were not realized until about 12 months afterwards. So there was a learning period before they ultimately produce these higher margins. Now, what this is evidence again is, is uh, it, what is against is that these pricing algorithms are just improving optimization or leading to dynamic pricing because those would be uh, present even if only a single firm uh, had adopted. Okay. Now, if there's efficiencies from being able to respond quicker to, to demand, you would see an effect with just a single adoption. But the fact that we're only seeing an effect when both stations adopt is consistent with the hypothesis that it's producing reduced competition. Okay. So um, once again, this is a, a, a good time to take any questions. Brian. Hi, Hi. thank you thank for you your, uh, your time this evening, Jonathan. Oh, there we go. So um, I guess you were mentioned before the uh, agent problem uh, with regards to uh, kind of third parties and people acting in the interest of others. And it kind of takes me to the real estate market, which it, it seems like there's a fair amount of inefficiency with realtors who you know, may or may not know, um, you know much about the industry or you know, maybe new to the industry or they, you know, at, at a bare minimum have some incentive problems in terms of how they think about you know, getting a deal done or uh, just you know, pricing it just to get it sold. So do you think that the overall welfare would be improved 
by giving consumers the ability to update their pricing um, more in real time, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, aside from, you know, regulatory issues of getting that going, just the idea of taking out the individuals who have varying incentives. Uh, yeah, I, I, my guess would be absolutely because of the fact that, you know, you start from such an inefficient institution in the real estate market. You know, you think about the incentive scheme for real estate agents. I mean, it's just horrible in terms of incentives, you know, to give them a fraction of the price of the house does provides, a, you know, a small fraction of, a, of the entire price of the house provides very weak incentives to actually sell the price, sell the house at a higher price. Because if you get into a 6% commission, which is you do if you're both sides of the market, you know, you get another $10,000, that's only $600. And then why are you getting compensation for a big part of that price, which anyone could get? So you're starting from a really inefficient system to begin with. Uh, and so I would suspect there's potentially indeed large gains from, you know, basically just anything that kind of revises you know, that kind of contractual arrangement and just more broadly institutional arrangement between, you know, the real estate agents and the two sides of the market. Great, thank you. I haven't, seen, I haven't seen a good study, for example, though, looking at, for example, the impact of Zillow and the information that that provides, but that would certainly be, you know, a worthwhile avenue. Yeah, because I, I, you know, I've seen a lot of articles with regards to, you know, that they're losing money on, you know, kind of their flipping home business, but I would also assume they're gaining a lot of information in that process. Right, yeah. Uh, Michael, you're up. Yeah, hi. Uh, quick question. Are there fair, fairness uh, regulations to prevent a black box algorithm from charging a higher price to a different group, such as race or gender, something along those lines? Um, I would presume so. <clears throat> I mean, I would think there would, there would, there would, yes. I mean, I mean, certainly that's true on the wages. So I presume that must be on the prices. I don't know for sure. Uh, that is certainly, a, you know, going back to the credit and insurance markets example. I mean, that's a very important avenue for research because, you know, there's this whole body of work on algorithmic bias. Because mm -hmm. you think about what the algorithms are just trying to do, what machine learning there is to do, is just come up with the best predictor. But the problem is the best predictor might give a lot of weight to race, you know, or to gender. And that then runs into, if not, you know, legal issues, certainly, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of social norms. But then the challenge it really gets to be, you know, well, how do you shut that down? Because we know that even if you say, well, you can't condition on race or gender, the machine learning algorithm will find correlates with that and effectively do the same thing. And so that has been a real challenge to kind of think about how can you constrain machine learning so that it basically produces, you know, kind of, it does not build in bias. And I know, in fact, there's a, there's a working group at Penn, which combines economists, engineers, computer scientists, and people from the law school, because there's an issue of, you know, how do you define fairness? And then how do you get algorithms to respect that notion of fairness? So it's a fascinating area. Great, thank you. Uh, next question uh, comes from Frank. He typed in the chat, but I'll ask him to unmute so he can uh, ask. Hey, Aaron, thanks. Joe, this is really interesting conversation. I, I'm just wondering, is this a, a result of the algorithm actually working or simply just monitoring local prices, adjusting those prices and kind of creating a, um, a computer collusion, if you will? Um, it, it seems like that's what it's essentially doing, colluding on prices locally without humans actually interacting. And is that kind of a legal gray area? Uh, yes, and in fact, I will touch upon that. It's definitely a legal gray area. Um, uh, in terms of whether it's doing that, that is one of the working hypotheses. Um, certainly, if you look at the paper, that, that's rather prominent. You know, trying to get at that is difficult um, because even here, I say with this study, they actually don't directly observe that the firm adopts the pricing algorithm they really indirectly infer that. And I didn't think they do so in a fairly compelling way, but what it speaks to is the fact of that the, the firms and the vendors are maintaining a high level of confidentiality. 
So what we would need to know to kind of get at that, we just, you know, they just don't have the information, but that certainly is one of the working hypotheses that they have, you know, effectively learned to collude, which we know gasoline stations, in fact, is always kind of like the canonical case of tacit collusion where one station raises their price and the other station across the street interprets that as an invitation to collude and then does so likewise. And, uh, and, so, um, and so then the question is, well, have the algorithms kind of learned to do the same thing? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so we'll take Kurt next and then we'll uh, let uh, Professor Harrington move on uh, so we can get to the rest of this. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, thinking back to the initial study that you shared about Uber and it was talking about surge pricing and how it actually benefited riders. And then we were talking about this check company and how they decentralize their pricing, um, allowing the consumers to choose basically what they want to pay. I think it's obvious we can see kind of the benefit to consumers in the sense that they're selecting the price that they're going to pay and they can kind of choose between the drivers. But to me, it also kind of raises this kind of issue of the nature of the drivers kind of playing some sort of role in this ultimate game. And I'm curious to see, I'm not sure if that was included in the study or what your thoughts would be if consumer welfare would actually be worse off if, for instance, they had like a surplus of greedy drivers, let's say, like at that time. Ah, yes. Uh, it, yeah, no, that's a good question. And particularly, you know, if I go back to that first study on Uber, one of the things they did in the study, uh, Camilo Castillo, is he could infer what Uber's objective was. And what's interesting is the objective best, what the data is saying is the objective of Uber was to actually maximizing rider surplus was better, a better description than maximizing Uber's profits. Now, of course, that might just be a short term strategy to get kind of, kind of sit, you know, get placed in the market and establish your position. But it does then raise the question of, well, what are the objectives of the platform compared to the objectives of the individual drivers? And you're absolutely right. It isn't clear how that's going to net out in terms of welfare, because the drivers, you know, they just they they want to just presumably make as much money as they can. They're interested in their labor income. They might actually work together to do that. There have been there have been anecdotes where drivers have coordinated to stay out of an area to get surge multipliers up, and then they go into the area. Um, and while the platform the platform is going to can be considered concerned with both sides of the market they want both of them to go there. So they, they get a little bit closer to kind of welfare in that sense. So that, but that's another really important question, but it was very much an open question. This was like the first study that I seen was it was able to say something really substantive about the objective of the platform. And we see it's kind of more towards maximizing rider surplus. Uh, Joe, we have a question from Adam, or do you want to keep going and come to this question uh, in your Q&A? Yeah, maybe I ought to do that at the end of the time. Okay. Um, okay, so I want to get on to the final topic, which is collusion. And so what I'm going to do is going to briefly go over just, you know, just a few com key components of collusion, talk about how pricing algorithms can help with that, but then also talk about whether, you know, and just as we were discussing, in the case of the retail gasoline market, whether or not you know, the learning algorithms themselves can learn to collude. Okay, so collusion is all about firms coordinating to restrain competition, specifically we, it's commonly in terms of higher prices. And that involves, it requires them to coordinate on some common price, to monitor for compliance, because we know with that higher price is always an incentive to cheat, to try to undercut it, to pick up more market share at this very lucrative price cost margin. And then you need to have punishments because if there's evidence of non-compliance, you need to somehow make the deviators suffer because otherwise then they'll just have an incentive to cheat. So, to, so here I just want to give you a few anecdotes just to give you a flavor of the complexity associated with when you know, humans collude in terms, of, in terms of price. So here's a uh, gasoline cartel in Quebec and the way this, and we have a lot of good information on this one because the authorities learned about this cartel and then wiretapped their telephones. So we have, you know, detailed inf information about the communication. So if you have a cartel leader, it decides to, uh, wants to raise price. It then calls up a few of the big other big firms 
it, it kind of negotiates for a while. They settle on some price. They then call up some other firms to, to inform them of the price. And after all that's done, you get a higher price in the market. On average, it took 65 phone calls. So a lot of communication, you know, just to coordinate on this one price increase. In terms of monitoring, let's turn to a gasoline cartel in Brazil. And so they had a scheme whereby they colluded on price and they had a committee that would drive around, look at the gasoline prices on the sides, uh, on the signs by the road. If they saw someone wasn't setting the price, they'd have someone from the trade association come to try to get them in line and so forth. The point here is just to convey that it takes a lot of effort to coordinate on price to, and, to, and to monitor price. So now let's think about how this could be made easier if the firms don't coordinate on price, but rather on pricing algorithms. So first of all, they don't need to communicate every time they want to change price in response to, let's say, a change in cost. Think about you want to change the gasoline price in response to a change in the wholesale price. You can just now coordinate on the pricing algorithm, which will specify how the price changes to the wholesale price or any other factors. So you can just build in that response. Furthermore, if these pricing algorithms are accessing competitors' prices online, then monitoring becomes very easy. And furthermore, you can build into the pricing algorithms a retaliation as soon as lower prices are observed. And so if all that's understood, then you know, if I'm you know, colluding with you, we're coordinating on these pricing algorithms, I'm not gonna want to deviate from that pricing algorithm to set a lower price because I know your algorithms are already designed to immediately make that unprofitable. So you can see we're coordinating on pricing algorithms, still humans, but coordinating on pricing algorithms can be a much more effective form of collusion. Uh, in spite of that, the fact that it is much more effective, I'm just aware of one case that's been prosecuted. Uh, this was of uh, sellers, uh, online sellers of posters on Amazon Marketplace. Uh, two companies were Trod and GBI. Their cases were pursued in the US and the UK. And just to give you a flavor of that, and I think just for time, uh, let's go down to the second bullet point. The Department of Justice said that the defendant and his co-conspirators wrote computer code that instructed algorithm-based software to set prices in conformity with this agreement. And what it specifically did, the pricing algorithm, is it would look at the prices of all the other sellers, but those two, find the lowest price one, and then they would both set a common price just below that lowest price. So they're still competing against the other sellers, but they're not competing against each other. Okay, nice, simple, kind of effective device. Um, okay, so now we get to the last issue though. Here we talked about humans colluding with the assistance of pricing algorithms. What about the learning algorithms themselves colluding? So the Federal Trade Commission has engaged in a number of hearings. This is from late 2018, where they're looking at a lot of issues associated with digital markets and, and algorithms, but one of the panels, <clears throat> excuse me, was on algorithmic collusion, which I participated in along with some legal scholars, some practitioners, uh, and some other, some other economists, okay? Uh, and one of the things we looked at was this issue of, well, how plausible is it that learning algorithms can actually learn how to collude? Well, we have a paper recently that just came out in the American Economic Review, which kind of looks at that from a simulated perspective. So just think about a market environment. You have firms selling different products, but they, they compete in the same market. They're gonna be setting prices, but now the price is gonna be set by a learning algorithm. And in particular, what they're, and let me say, these learning algorithms are totally independent from one another. So you can imagine the managers at these different companies have no intent to collude. They just each has independently decided that pricing is really hard. I'm gonna adopt a learning algorithm to determine my price. And they use, reinforcement learning and a particular manifestation of that called Q-learning. And so what the Q-learning does is it assigns a price to a state. And so you as the programmer, the firm would say, well, what are, what are states? What are we, how are we gonna define that? In their model, state was just the previous period's prices. So what the pricing algorithm is at any moment in time, it assigns a price depending upon what the firm's priced at last period. And then over time, they're going to 
price, they're going to receive profits, and then they're going to update that pricing algorithm, update the price associated with, with a particular state based upon how well the algor uh, pricing algorithm has performed. And so what they do is they just initiate the, the learning algorithm, let this thing run for a real long time, and we're interested in, well, where does this thing converge? OK, so what this figure here shows, you can't really read the, the axes, but, that, but that's not a problem. This is the price of one firm. This is the price of the other firm. Here's the competitive price. Here's the monopoly price. And what's plotted here is the histogram. So, so through many of these sessions that they run, simulated sessions, it just plots the frequency of sessions where this was the pair of prices. And what we're going to take away from this is that prices are rarely at the competitive price. And they're a lot closer to the monopoly price than they are to the competitive price. So certainly in terms of prices, we're seeing anti-competitive outcomes. Now, there's still the issue of, well, what's really behind this? Is it really collusion as we think about it, or is it something else? <clears throat> well, what they need to do is now, this is where you need to kind of get inside the pricing algorithm. That is, you know, here are the prices we observed, but what's really the pricing algorithm that the learning algorithm has converged to? Okay, so this is from a particular run. This is just the prices that were realized. So you can see it starts out low, but then they ultimately climb and they settle down at some high level. And, and what the authors of the study do is they say, what, they, what they're doing is they're gonna perturb the pricing algorithm. They're going to intervene and they're gonna force firm one to set a lower price. And then just let the pricing algorithms price as, 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 as they're programmed to do. And what they wanna see is how does it respond to this lower price? And what we see here is the other firm's pricing algorithm immediately responds with a much lower price. The pricing algorithm that was forced to set a lower price doesn't bounce back up to a high price. It actually keeps its price low, in some sense anticipating that the other algorithm is going to price low in response to the fact that it priced low the previous period. And then eventually prices get back up to the collusive level. So what we have here is the Learn the, the algorithm, the learning algorithm has learned how to punish deviations from the collusive price. <clears throat> so why do they keep setting this high price? Because they kind of some sense know that if they set a low price, the other algorithm is going to punish them for it, and that's going to make it unprofitable for them. And this indeed is how they've learned to collude. <clears throat> so now we get to this issue that was raised, which is that, well, is this problematic? Okay, but let's just first of all say, in response to the question, can AI learn to collude in simulated markets? Yes, we just shown that. Can AI learn to collude in real markets? Well, that's an open question. And you know, perhaps that's what we saw in the German retail gasoline market. We don't know, but it's an open question. But if AI did learn to collude in real markets, is it illegal? And I would say no. And if we ask, you know, what's illegal according to jurisprudence in the US and EU and other jurisdictions, it's uh, an agreement that's illegal. And an agreement is a meeting of minds among the firms, a conscious commitment to a common scheme, joint intention, concurrence of wills. All of these say the same thing, which is that these firms have developed a mutual understanding that they're going to somehow constrain competition. So let's think about it. Is collusion by AI illegal by that definition? Well, the managers are not liable because they never communicated. They acted independently. They may never even have foreseen the possibility of collusion by, by their learning algorithms. AI is not liable because it doesn't possess understanding, much less mutual understanding. And of course, this gets into deep philosophical issues associated can machines actually understand. It goes back to John Searle, the philosopher's, John Searle's Chinese room argument, concludes that no, and I buy that argument. Well, is the company liable? Should it be liable for its software like it is for its employees? Is the third party software developer liable? Were they negligent not to have designed it to prevent this type of activity? So it's an open question of if AI can include, how can society stop it? How can it prevent it? Now, you might think that, well, these are science fiction questions. You know, this is not really a concern. This is something that should appear in Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine. But in fact, last November, it appeared in the 
scholarly journal Science, where the four economists who did the simulation study along with myself published an article expressing the fact that AI collusion is a possibility and our legal systems are not prepared to deal with it. And with that, I will close and I welcome any further questions. So uh, just a quick uh, virtual round of applause for that. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Harrington. Um, so we'll, uh, so obviously we had a lot of questions during that, which is awesome. We still have some time for some Q and A. Um, I'd like to start off with the first one that came from Adam uh, in that last uh, break. Um, so uh, Adam typed, uh, the financial services sector is very concerned about discriminating based on protected consumer traits, uh, race, gender, sexual preferences, et cetera. But is it possible that even when the algorithm does not have explicit access to this information, you can effectively uh, determine this through behavioral aspects and then create legal issues through uh, disparate impacts? Um, how much legal exposure do you think this could create? Um, yeah, so I can't comment on the kind of the legal exposure. I'm just, I'm just not knowledgeable on that kind of side of the question. But but certainly in terms of the fact that I think it's well recognized that simply not conditioning on race, gender, or whatever the other traits that prices should not depend upon, that uh, that is insufficient. You know that these machine learning algorithms you know are designed to predict, and they can if they and they can get at race in an indirect way. Uh, so, um, you know, so what, what, what one would hope is there will be some legal responsibility to companies with regards to this, because that's going to, I think, provide better incentives to design algorithms that will try to prevent that. So you can imagine, and this is where this literature on fairness and algorithm is coming in, is that they're thinking about how can we constrain the algorithm to prevent that this type of discrimination. And and when that becomes possible, then you can think about a company being negligent by not constraining its algorithm in, the, in that way. And I think about that as well as in case of collusion. You know, if this obviously becomes a, really a, a problem that learning algorithms could learn to collude, uh, then what you like is you like to put some legal burden on the firms so they would engage in activities such as testing their algorithms to see whether or not they're colluding, just like we saw with the simulation constraining their learning algorithms in order to avoid that. Rafael, you're up. Um, yes, so uh, can I put you on the hot seat a little bit, Joe? Do I have a choice? <laughs> Go ahead. So um, if you were a competition policy czar or a, you know, if, you, if, we, if you were summoned by the current administration to advise the FTC or the DOJ on this matter, what, what, what would be your thoughts here? What, what, what's your position? Uh, okay, well, on what specifically? On the algorithm? Oh, on, on, on how to deal with algorithmic collusion. Well, you know, I would say, you know, we're at a stage where, okay, there's two things. One is, I think we need to change the legal structure to prepare for it. So this is something that, you know, I, I've written a piece on um, and we, you know, one of the things that we have, to, we, we, I think we recognize is that um, AI is very, developments in AI is very hard to predict. You know, think about the path of self-driving cars. For, for a while there, it thought it was impossible. Then it, then it looked like very promising. And now it's been kind of in a holding pattern. But the point is it's hard to predict. So we don't want to be left, you know, kind of unprotected. So I think we should definitely kind of revisit how we, think about the illegality of collusion. So there is a legal structure in place to deal with algorithmic collusion should it occur. So that should be done now. In terms of actually kind of clamping down on it, you know, given we don't have any documented instances of it in actual markets, at least that we're aware of, uh, I think it's more where more research needs to be done. And, and where the research would be, as I said, uh, of the form of creating like, like the, those scholars have done, creating algorithmic collusion in the lab, and then thinking about how can we constrain the learning algorithms to prevent that. And maybe we would work that towards that to be something that would be guidelines for companies, you know, in terms of if they use algorithms, just like guidelines I would think are ultimately developed to ensure fairness. And, and, and that's probably as far as I would go. I wouldn't think about prosecuting it. Uh, but, um, you know, but we'll just, you know, it's, it's important that we make some progress on those two fronts. 
Okay, uh, we got uh, two questions in the queue. Uh, Rich, you'll, you'll, you'll go up first. Thanks, I think this is probably good on the heels of what Raphael uh, asked you to uh, weigh in on. Um, you know, what, back when you were talking about the Google's uh, uh, paid search marketplace and the kind of subtext of the secondary markets for the private marketplace bidding um, that, you know, vendors have, and a number of vendors have them. Um, it's, and there are incentives in that. So for me, having spent some time doing this, uh, doing digital marketing in that way, it's Google has the same, not the same, but they have their own market algorithms, dynamic bidding um, for search terms and for that matter, for video play, for uh, uh, graphic placement. Um, given that their market share is, I think it's 80 or 80 or 90 percent. Doesn't isn't this kind of a more pernicious uh, problem? Um, and I know they're up on any charge, uh, yeah. charge any trust charges. I, I get that. But that and Facebook, this is a more these kind of captured platforms are more pernicious in what they're what is possible. And I guess part, isn't this more of a problem almost because. Vendors would have somewhere to go in the private marketplace, the, these bidding marketplaces that go out and bid on inventory. Um, but once you're within Google or within Facebook or within Amazon, you're you're captured. So, yeah. no, you're 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 absolutely right. I don't I don't know that on a on a deep level, but I um, know having spoken with some people like Fiona Scott Morton, who's done some important work on this. Uh, this this is a first order issue without a doubt. Uh, um, I don't know how much it's going to, you know, there's, there's been, there's been a lot of proposals to deal with this. You know, some people have proposed, uh, first of all, they just noted that antitrust is a very slow, clunky instrument for dealing with exactly what you're describing. So some people have proposed having more of a digital regulator, you know, because the fact that they will be able to operate more quickly, they will have more expertise to deal with it. Uh, Cause a lot of these things, you got to deal with this more. You, let's go back, for example, in time to the Microsoft case, you know, by the time that case was settled, you know, it was a moot issue in terms of, of, of the industry. So, um, so the point is that number one, you're absolutely right. From my understanding that that's a major problem. Uh, and number two, right now we don't have the instruments to really deal with it. Uh, and right now we've had proposals and trying to come in up with, uh, with, with new ones. Uh, I don't think it's gonna deal with that, but I was just reading Amy Klobuchar's proposed piece of legislation for reforming the antitrust laws and their implementation. And it's a very good piece. I mean, you can see she must have gotten a lot of input from economists because it touches upon a lot of the kind of the, the market competition and market dominance concerns that, that have arisen. Uh, kind of in the last you know decade or so. Okay, we have a question from Frank, and then we'll have uh, we're over at, at seven p.m. now, so then we'll have one more question from Perang. Uh, so uh, Frank asks, um, "Isn't AI's intent to emulate human thought processes? Mm -hmm. Then they are in fact acting as humans and colluding." Would you agree? <laughs> uh, that's that's it, 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 you know that, that sounds like. Your next topic for the strategy talk, I think, is uh, uh, yeah. No, it's a, well, it's an interesting, you know, circle of things. Um, uh, I guess that probably was the initial kind of uh, thought about AI, you know. But when you think about a lot of the instances we're looking at here, uh, it's really just to yield better solutions to problems. Um, and uh, and and so I, so even if it started there, I think it's gone past that, you know. Um, and, you know, in fact, it's kind of an interesting point on this issue about algorithmic collusion. There's different views on it from economists. I mean, I tend to be somewhat agnostic on it because it's unclear what AI can and cannot do. It's hard to predict. Uh, some people uh, think that AI collusion is going to be easy. Some people think it's going to be really hard. Um, but I'm a little bit hesitant to say it's hard because humans can collude and they can engage in tacit collusion without communication. And I'm not prepared to say there's anything that AI can't do that humans can do. You know, so. 
Purain, you'll be our last question. Hi. Uh, sorry, similar to the previous question, uh, but uh, uh, so uh, given the seeming and collusion by AI, AI algorithms, I want to uh, ask is how different would that be from non collusive response by competing firms to the others' as price changes? Because one would expect that over multiple time periods, there would be a convergence in price. It may happen at a lower frequency, but one could still expect that two competing firms would respond to the other. So um, is it just that the uh, price that the AI algorithms are providing is at a higher price than would otherwise be observed? Uh, yeah, no, no, good question. Um, let's this way, you can have dynamics like best response dynamics, and those will converge. For example, let's go back here to best response dynamics under certain conditions, and they're just that, that the, the market's kind of demand functions, well behaving like, they'll converge to the competitive price. So there's lots of dynamics. That, that will just actually converge to the competitive price. So it takes something more. And what really makes, you know, you know collusion occur here is there's, there's a sense, it's not best response dynamics, but let me describe it that way. It's best response dynamics in regards to pricing rules, not prices. If you just have a best response dynamic to prices so that, well, whatever price they're charging yesterday, I'm gonna charge the price today that maximizes my profit today that's gonna to converge to the competitive price. So it's really the sophistication that they're learning and adapting to the pricing rules, how you map prices to states that's resulting in these, in these uh, supra competitive prices. And that's, and that's a quite different thing. Okay, uh, well, that concludes uh, this evening's talk. Um, Professor Harrington, thank you so much for being here and presenting this awesome talk. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for your question. It was a great time.